Perfect, thank you. So first agenda item being normally call to order declaration of quorum. We don't have a quorum because we're one member short. So what we are gonna do is we're gonna move through some of the agenda items that are presented uh, on the agenda on our uh, city website, um, but we will not be making any action item decisions. So does that mean then that we don't vote on the suspension of the rules? Correct. Right, sir. Correct. <laughs> so essentially we will skip a suspension of the rules and the approval of last of the uh, June meeting minutes because we don't have a quorum. So we'll skip the suspension of the rules and that, and that meeting minutes vote. And we will jump to uh, public comment. Is there anybody from our attendees or our guest list who would like to make a comment at this time? If you would please indicate by raising your virtual hand and, and I will promote you to speak. Okay. Okay, oh, I don't see any comments sorry. at this time. Wait, I do. Looks like someone raising your hand. Yep. Oh. Okay. I'm gonna promote people in the order um, that I saw them. Right. So the first person we have joining us is Marie. Hey everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. And mm -hmm. okay. My name is Mary Anise and I'm from Haiti. And me and my family, we moved from Haiti six years ago to come to the United States. And before we moved to Florida, now we in Chicago. And when I when I move here, they make me get me connected with family focus because I had a special in child. So I want to support the, the program, you know, the Welcome Family Program. I think it will be ben really beneficial because if it wasn't them, I don't know what I would do. Because I did not know any, you know, anyone. And my partner together is um, Whitney Noise and she's, she's awesome. She, she helped me with everything I can say, you know, give me resources. Be there for me when I'm struggling because you know I'm a special kid child. It's not easy, you know. So I want to support. I think that that would be a good thing. That will make um, the process more smoothly for families here. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your comment, Marie. We appreciate it. Okay, Marie, I'm going to drop you back down to an attendee. And um, then I'm gonna invite um, Yari, Yari, Yaritza to speak. So I, I apologize. Um, give me just one moment. Okay, Yari, I'm working to promote you. Okay, great. Okay, she should be joining. Oh no, I think I lost Yari. Yeah, I don't see her in the attendees list anymore. Mm -mm. I'm sorry. We will watch to see if she comes back and if if and try to make sure that you know. Um, oh wait, here. Oh, we got her. Oh yay, there. Oh good. Wonderful. Hi, Ari. Yaritza, you're on mute. It looks like you're on mute. If you could unmute yourself, that would be, there you go. Thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Yari. Um, I am one of the parent educators at Family Focus. I have a couple of participants who they actually uh, only speak Spanish, but they did give me a little snippet for me to share on behalf of them. So I'll just read a couple of them. 
Um, my name is Anna. I am a mother of three young girls and I came from Mexico a couple of years ago. My two youngest have both been in the Parents as Teachers program working with Yeti. I met Yeti at WIC and I've learned so much from her. It was nice to be able to learn so much from someone who not only understands my culture, but that I feel comfortable speaking my language with. My husband is the only one who was working, but when the pandemic hit, he lost his job. Thanks to Yeti and Family Focus, we were able to continue to receive diapers, get formula, and even some food. There was a couple of times that she even got us some hot meals. Thanks to the program at Family Focus, my family and I have learned so much, not only about my child's developments, but also additional resources in the community. Another mom sent me also, she wrote, I am a single mother of seven children, all ranging from oldest who is 20 years old to the youngest who is currently in the Parents as Teachers program who is a year and a half. I have been in the Parents as Teachers program for about two years now. Me and my family have gained so much from family focus. For example, learning the different ways that I can help my son with his development, but also the additional resources that are available to me. I am able to help my child with his development and but also be able to advocate not only for him, but for my other children. Although my English is not that great, I have loved what Family Focus and Yaritza has been able to do for me. Not only am I able to communicate and communicate with her, but also feel comfortable communicating with her and being able to learn so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yari. Okay, Yari, I'm gonna drop you back down to an attendee. Thank you. Okay, well, there's no further public comment, then we can move to agenda item five, which is, uh, I believe this would be the family focus presentation, right, Jessica? Yep, um, and I apologize. I need to promote Mariana to a panelist so that you can present. I think I think I am already promoted. Oh, good. Okay. Well, if you have any trouble, <laughs> I can help I you. I'm try to share my screen, so uh, you know that's usually where the trouble starts. <laughs> <laughs> We're in it together. Yes. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm very excited to be here with you all, and just you love to hear those those stories from three parents that have been impacted by family focus. There's so many more, but every time we hear them, it's just incredibly touching and gratifying. And, you know, we want to continue to provide that support. Um, okay, so let me try to share my screen so we can start this presentation. So if you can please confirm, you see Family Focus, City of Evanston and Social Services Committee. Yes, that's it. Wonderful, wonderful, great, great, great. Well, again, thank you again. My name is Mariana Osoria. I'm the Senior Vice President of Partnerships and Engagement for Family Focus. And as you all heard, Dara is listening in, not feeling well, but she, we know she's got our backs and we have hers. Um, we're a great team working together. So before I start, I'd like to have the rest of our team members introduce themselves. So we can start with Dottie. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us here this evening to present our proposal to you. I'm Dottie Johnson, I'm CFO for Family Focus. And I will ask, Vanessa, I know she can't pop on screen, but she can uh, introduce herself anyway. Good evening, everyone. I can I feel like I can't apologize enough for the fact that my camera isn't working. I'm trying to figure that out. But thank you all for having us. I am Vanessa Allen, and I am the center director at Family Focus Evanston. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Dottie. And I think, Vanessa, the camera's just tired. You know, it's later in the day. You've probably been on it a lot. So it's like, I need a break. No, I uh, again, that. <laughs> again, thank you all so much. Um, we're here to answer any questions that you all might have for the proposal. We, we know that you all had opportunity to 
look at it and probably know know it front and back but we're here to kind of share a little bit give it a bring it to life a little bit and then answer any questions that you might have um so again thank you for the opportunity um you might be asking yourself uh why a welcoming center right what does that mean exactly what is a welcoming center what is you know what is it going to do what's the purpose etc um, and so some of the reasons that we think that it's incredibly important to bring a welcoming center to Evanston is for some of the things that you see on the screen. But we've been in conversation about this actually since December of, you know, 20, I have been in conversations with, with about it since December of 2021. And since then, there's been further conversations to really think about with the city, with other leaders, wh why we should bring a welcoming center to the city of Evanston. And so, as you can see, and you probably are all aware, Latino growth has continued to grow um, in the city of Evanston for many years, uh, specifically in the past 10, from 2010 to, 2000, to 2020, there's been about a 34% increase in the percentage of Latinos in the city of Evanston. And if we go back, to 2000, there's been an almost 100% increase in the percentage of Latinos in the city of Evanston. And so um, I'm sure there is there are more data points even before that, because we know Latinos have been in the city for some time, but those are just some of those most recent ones. And that is uh, what the Census American Community Survey data has been showing us. Um, in addition to that, the percentage of foreign born population, so that is not just Latinos, but anyone who was born outside of the United States um, is between 18 and 19 percent, um, according to different census statistics. As you know, there's different data measures that they use, but that's about the, the percentage of um, foreign born folks in the city of Evanston. And as you might be aware, many suburban cities outside of the city of Chicago, much of the growth in those uh, suburban areas have been attributed to Latinos and that is also the case here in Evanston. And then, you know, one of the key pieces is, and, and you heard it a little bit in, in the, the testimonies, is a place that's safe, that's secure, and that is welcoming. And so as you probably are aware, immigrants and refugees come with all kinds of statuses, right? There are, you know, foreign born folks who might be legal permanent residents, they might be citizens, they might have family members who are citizens, but they might not be, they might have a family member who does not have a regularized status. So um, because of, for that reason, uh, immigrants and refugees are very cautious about where they go, how they access service, where they go to get the support that they need. So a place that understands their culture, a place where their language is spoken, and in particular, a place that is welcoming, right? A place that as you enter, you know that you are going to be welcomed there, right? Like a warm hug, like a good cup of coffee, you know, a place to sit down and just know that you can, you know, lay your troubles here. So um, that really is what it, one of the main reasons. As you heard Marie talk, uh, first, I was, you know, I re am remembering many of the families that I have heard that said, this is a safe place. This is a welcoming place. Someone told me that I can get help here. Um, you know, this was the, the only other place besides my home where I knew somebody in this new country. So all of those reasons are connected to why, why we need a welcoming center. Um, why family focus, you might ask, right? So I want to reference a quote that actually we used in a different presentation from our lovely center director, Dr. Vanessa Allen. Um, and it says, you know, our community must maintain this haven um, it, as it is a strong source of education, advocacy, and other prevention and intervention services that help strengthen children and families within the community. And then this last line that I think is really critical is family focus is the place to go when you need help in the community. I underlined it and I put it in red um, because I think that is exactly the case. And although we, we really like to think about our work as supporting families, we know that many families come to us because they have either heard from a neighbor, a friend, a family member, their parish, that family focus can support them, can help them. We may not be able to do it all, but we can certainly guide them to them. So we we know that we we have 
resources and tools to support families. In addition to that, Family Focus has experience in administering the Welcoming Center model. Uh, we do this already in three community areas. So in the town of Cicero, in the Northwest side of Chicago, and then also in the city of Aurora. And then you all might be aware of the work that we are trying to do with the Evanston building in general. Um, you know, our community location, that spot is a haven already for our community. And what we hope to bring as an overall vision is a hub of services and resources, not only for immigrants and refugees, but for folks in the Fifth Ward um, and for other surrounding community areas to really support um, families and to, you know, support community development. So we, we think that, you know, family focus is well suited to deliver these programs. We have a history of success. Uh, I think I shared in the proposal that on a couple of our deliverables, most recently, we, you know, exceeded our expectations, um, you know, by over 200%. So, we really have the experience. We've been doing it for some time. We feel like we have the relationship and connection in Evanston to be able to roll this out in, in the Evanston community as well. I'll quickly go over these services. I, I saw lots of head shaking when the when the uh, the public comment was happening. So I feel like folks know family focus and the work we do, but I'll just quickly say, you know, we do early childhood, which is the heart and soul of the work that we do, kind of how we started, youth development work, uh, family support, which includes things like the Family Advocacy Center, the youth programs, our case management, grandparents raising grandchildren, which you might not know this, but they have published two books and I think are working on another. Um, so it's it's really a dynamic group of programming and program services. And we wrote there in the Welcoming Center in italics, we don't currently have this, but we hope that we will have about 300 participants minimum annually in those direct services. That doesn't include some of the peripheral services that I'll talk about in a moment uh, that welcoming centers offer. And so I'll start, you know, you might ask like, what is a welcoming center? It might feel very intuitive, a place that's welcoming that you can provide services, but there is actually a concrete concrete model and it has these four components in it. Uh, the first component, and I think really the anchor of the work is the one-stop shop idea. And you see the icon that I use there is an open door because we like to think about this as being an open door or not entering any wrong door. So any door a family or participant or individual enters is the right one. And a welcoming center staff member would be able to help that individual family participant navigate whatever their immediate need was. Um, we know that families come to our center, you know, on a daily basis, again, just because someone told them that they could find some support there. Well, what a welcoming center will do is identify what that need is and then also provide assessment services for that family to determine what other holistic services that family unit might need to be able to, to meet that initial request that they had or anything else. One of the things that we found, for example, when we do assessment is there are multiple generations in our families. And we find many times that elders living in the home that are actually eligible for state services are not engaged in those services because they first don't know that they're eligible too, because there might be some fear or lack of understanding of how that might impact their immigration status. And what a welcoming center has staff that has been able to do is really explain that, talk through that, connect those resources and really support families in particular to elders in particular to access Medicaid services, to get um, SNAP benefits, for example. And all of those things contribute to that overall family's success by, you know, changing the economic dynamic within that household. So that's just one example, but that assessment will really help to identify what that family needs in terms of additional support services. And that one-stop idea is that we will provide those services in-house as family focus, the building and the concept expands and we bring in additional tenants, and I'll talk about the current tenants that we have a little bit later, we will be able to bring those resources that families are identified that we don't, that we don't do directly, but we know that they support, um, they will support the community and the community needs. Um, 
And that kind of leads us to this co-location model, which is basically working with other entities um, in the community that provide direct service. Sometimes those types of services that might be um, that might be more difficult to engage in, for example, domestic violence or mental health services. We have identified partners to co-locate in our space to provide those services so that a direct referral happens that's easily easy to follow up on and much more successful so that you've heard the term like the warm handoff. But this is almost a little bit deeper than that because we will follow up with that partner to ensure that the family has engaged. And if they're physically in our building, that helps that referral be more successful in that, you know, there's a difference between saying, you know, this office is two doors down or on the second floor versus, you know, three miles away, or, you know, you have to travel to that place. So we have found that co-location to be really successful in terms of partnering with us. We also will co-locate the other way around. So one of the things that you saw in the proposal is that immigrants are across the whole city. Um, they're not just in one community area. And so we will partner, for example, with District 65 and say, you know, maybe there is one day of the month where we do a, you know, mobile welcoming center and every Tuesday from XYZ time to XYZ time, we will be in that school building that those community area members can find that location a little bit more accessible. We've done that with elected officials offices. We've done that with city agencies and other play, other partners. So again, that co-location can go in both directions. Um, the community education component really is a monthly workshop or educational series. Um, it could be uh, classes that we would provide on a number of topics that would help immigrants and refugees be able to navigate their, their new city, their new town, their new state more effectively. And so it could include things like know your rights, understanding um, how to access COVID vac vaccination or health benefits, uh, how to understand the new education system that your children are attending, things like that. And that is gonna be driven by uh, both our expert staff, but in addition to that, our participants. And I'll talk a little bit about a co-creation opportunity that we're gonna have and, and other leaders and stakeholders, um, but really a collaborative effort to identify what are the key needs or areas of growth and opportunity for the community to develop and have more information so that they can meet their goals um, and their dreams for, their, for themselves and for their families. And then finally, there is a community alliance. The community alliance is basically a collaborative in a particular community area that looks at a number of things. One of those is gaps in services. And so identifying where those gaps are, where this collaborative can uh, work to leverage resources and leverage opportunities to bring additional resources um, into that community area, for example, it could be that in a community area, there is no Illinois Department of Employment Security office and it's too far away and, and that has been identified as a need, then that collaborative will work together to leverage their relationships and reach out to the state, et cetera, and other partners to bring those resources into the community. We'll also look at duplication of services as well as um, identifying and supporting other partners to be able to navigate and serve immigrants and refugees more effectively. So for example, when folks were talking about uh, sanctuary cities and sanctuary towns, welcoming centers did a lot of community education and collaboration with their partners to talk about what it was, what it wasn't, um, and to really be able to begin to have dialogue and deeper understanding. And so that the way that that manifests could be in a couple ways. It, for example, in some communities, we tag on to collaboratives that are already happening because that makes the more sense, more, most sense. And then in other communities, it is something that Family Focus will convene and facilitate, um, on, you know, on, not on its own, but will be the lead facilitator and then work with, with our partners. And so um, every community is different and we will respond to what that particular community needs. And that kind of leads me to this next piece um, around co-creation opportunities. And so as we've been having these conversations with key leaders and with some of our council members, um, we have, it has been brought up to really think about co-creation. And we are, we actually had a first meeting today and began to think about what those co-creation opportunities are. 
Um, yes, there is a model that we have, but we know again that every community, every city, every town is unique and we wanna be responsive to that. So what this opportunity will look like is the identification of focus groups. We will have a co-creation committee that will have key stakeholders, community leaders, our partners, elected officials, other nonprofits um, that will work in partnership with us if funded to really think about with a lot of intention what, what opportunities there are not only to serve immigrants and refugees, but where there are opportunities to leverage relationships, leverage experience in the fifth ward in particular, to be able to bring resources that serve the whole of the community, right? Not just that immediate community area and not just immigrants and refugees, but that there are oftentimes common needs and common opportunities that if thought about with intention, we can create opportunity that will bring a broader impact and broader community development. So that is a, an exciting part about this opportunity that we think that Evanston is very um, ready to do and, and interested in doing and thinking and being a thought partner with us. And then I just, this is just a, a, an idea of what some referral service or what services can be in a welcoming center. Again, as we create this together, you know, we may include all of these, we may include some of these and we will probably add to these, but I won't read these all off, but you can see things like very basic things like referral services. And again, when we think about referral services, we're thinking about expert referrals, right? Referrals that are successful because our staff are experts on the experts and understand intake, eligibility, um, wait lists and insurance requirements. All of those things that a program or a service or an entity might require, our team is going to have knowledge and understanding that will support that participant to be able to make that right referral and a successful referral. We have been providing emergency and crisis response. And in particular, uh, we, when COVID came, all of our welcoming centers were able to pivot um, with a lot of intention to be able to support the needs of uh, immigrants and refugees. And in particular, undocumented immigrants who who were initially left out of much of the uh, federal support and local support. And so um, we had to really be able to navigate and support those families in creative and unique ways. We'll provide court advocacy, interpretation and translation, um, notary services, mental health referrals, healthcare access, et cetera. All of those and many other services, whatever that community area is interested in providing and supporting. And just to share a little bit about what our tenants currently do, I'll remind you all that we have in our building, and this was also in the proposal, um, entrepreneurial services, education, preschool, community advocacy, infant toddler care, youth development. Together, we serve our services and our tenants um, 3,500 to 5,000 individuals. We know that when we open the welcoming center up, we will increase that amount. And as we continue to develop the services and, and continue to identify sustainable funding for that program, that we will be able to build that even um, more as we move move ahead and we, we strengthen these, these services in the community. We know that these are incredibly needed services. We, we know that we have you know, seen some of the reports that Evanston has done and focus group results. And we know that um, serving the Latino community, serving the immigrant community and leveraging relationships between our fifth ward residents and new residents will give us a lot of opportunity to really think about and respond to the needs of those community members, all with the eye towards supporting families to reach their goals. I know Dara likes to say, start with folks where they dream. That's what we wanna be doing, but we want to see those dreams become reality for our families. And that includes all families, regardless of their immigrant status. Um, and we, you know, we hope that you will uh, th agree with us that this proposal is uh, something that Evanston needs and that Family Focus is the right organization to implement this. And so we, I wanna offer an opportunity for questions if you have them, but moreover, I wanna say thank you again for the opportunity the last several months that I have had with um, 
working with the with all of the leaders in the community and with the city of Evanston has been incredible. So I appreciate that. And we've learned a lot, um, but we do have Dottie here that can answer any questions and Vanessa that can answer questions on the very local level. Um, so thank you. Thank you. All right, Mariana, thank you for that thorough presentation. Uh, do any of the committee members have any questions for Mariana or Dottie or any of the members from Family Pro Focus? Okay, I'll ask. Go ahead, Kathy. Hi, how are you? Thank you very much for the presentation. That was wonderful. And as a, I don't know, team alumni from Family Focus, 40 years plus, I'm very, <laughs> and we're still standing. <laughs> I'm very happy that you guys have come forward um, with best practices and dealing with families and welcoming, welcoming all of them into the community and integrating. Um, I, I just, my short question is the project, projection of population is what exactly uh, as you go forth uh, with this new, with this in, uh, endeavor? That was just my short question, but you know, I'm like totally team family focused. What can I say? Tell me what you mean uh, about projection of population. How many uh, people will, do you anticipate will be um, participating in most of the programs there um, and, and interacting, at, or you will be inter helping them interact with the community? Sure, sure. So it, so we think that uh, funded at the level that we've requested, we can serve 300 additional participants um, with direct services that includes an assessment, case management, follow up, etc. That does not include uh, referrals or, you know, we might get phone calls, for example, where we, a family is just still not ready to come into a space, but they need some information. We will also uh, document that and document those information and referral pieces. That'll be a much larger number, but in terms of that direct one-on-one -on -one family support services, about 300. Thank you. Yeah, just to go off of Kathy's question there, Mariana, uh, and I'm sorry if you mentioned this earlier, if it's in the proposal, but how do you find your, your community members? How do you find people who are looking for services? And then second, will will this be the additional 300? Will they be Evanston residents only or will they be within the area? So that's a, those are two really good questions. So the way we, we do a number of things when we try to find folks and we put in our timeline um, some outreach uh, activities that we'll need to do. We think that as we're ro rolling this out and planning, we'll be doing a couple things in the focus groups is getting folks to kind of know what we're doing. So that'll be one piece, right? Is sharing that information. There will be some intentional outreach and communication. We, um, you know, we, we have a lot of our, our folks come to us because of word of mouth. They've heard from a family friend, their neighbor, a relative, et cetera. So we certainly will rely on that, but we will also do some intentional outreach, which could include canvassing, which it could include working with our local parishes or faith-based entities, um, other nonprofits. So we'll want to, once we, uh, if, if we are awarded these funds, we'll want to get to those partners and then also work with their case managers, work with their team members, do presentations around what the services are, how to utilize them, how to access them. So those, um, those are some of the ways that we will do do some community outreach. We'll use our current participants as you know, leaders in the community to talk about the services that we do. We'll use newsletters like the, maybe the Evanston newsletter and uh, other Facebook type of social media um, announcements about the work that we'll be doing. So that that'll be, you know, we'll we'll begin planning that um, before, you know, we roll it out officially and then have an ongoing outreach and recruitment plan. The second question regarding the, the participants who can, who can join, I think our intention is several fold. We hope that, um, that we will be able to reach out to the Illinois Department of Human Services that funds welcoming centers. And so we, we have, um, we know that there will be a NOFO coming out soon. We know that in this last 
uh, General Assembly session, there was an increase of $20 million. So we know that the state of Illinois is committed to welcoming centers. With that being said, um, we think that our proposal to them will be stronger if we not only serve the city of Evanston, but also the surrounding areas. So places like Niles, um, Skokie, the north part of, of Chicago, because we know that there's a large immigrant and refugee population in those communities as well. Um, so we do expect that there would be opportunity for folks that reside outside of Evanston to also receive services. President, I think my last question on that is, do you have a proposed site identified within, within Evanston? So yeah, we, we would house this in our Evanston building in the fifth ward. So the family focus, our place, uh, Evanston building. And so again, you know, we would house it there. Our key staff would be housed there. We would have some co-location sites, some co-location entities there, but we would also want to be mobile um, because we know even in, for example, in our Cicero uh, community area, which is, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Cicero, it's six square miles. So it's pretty small. Um, but even there, we co-locate sometimes because, again, with the immigrant and refugee population, we're talking about folks who are really cautious in navigating public systems. And so we oftentimes will need to go where they are um, so that they can get those resources, places that they really trust. And for, you know, someone in a different war, that might be their local school, right? And so until we... we until the community fully knows us and understands us, we will need to be continuing to, to do co-location. Okay, thank you very much. Kathy, you had your hand, do you have another question? Oh, okay. No, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I, I got distracted. People started texting me, I apologize. Oh, no, no worries. I just wanted to make sure. All right, thank you. No, Is, no, uh, no, do no. Other... But I see we have uh, Alderman Reed here. Do we have anyone else coming in? Oh, oh yeah, no, Alderman Reed did join. Okay. Um, yeah, anybody else, including uh, Councilmember Reed, do you have any questions for the Family Focus team here? No, no, thank you. Okay, um, so Jessica, I think with Councilmember rejoining, that means we are at a quorum, right? We are, we needed one more person. Yes. Okay, well, that's good. So then with the family focus presentation here, are we voting on their funding proposal? Or is that, was that the intent of tonight? So no, we're not voting okay. tonight, uh, or the, I should say the committee's not voting tonight. Um, Understood, okay. Um, yeah, so that'll be uh, at our September meeting. So that everybody got it, okay. All right, great, thank you. You will be getting um, the ARPA rubric, which is a scoring sheet for each of the ARPA projects. Uh, and you'll have an opportunity to score the project on different uh, points. And you will be getting an email from either me or Jessica during uh, the next week. So you can put your scores in. Um, it's a Google form, which you will be sent the link to. And then um, we'll prepare the scoring and then also any additional public comment during next month's meeting. Thank you for that, Anna. Yes, and the committee has seen uh, that scoring rubric before uh, when the committee voted on the um, child care premium pay program, although Anna and Marion zooped it up for us by getting it into a Google form. So thank you, thank you, Anna, for your tech savviness. Very nice, thank you, Anna. And just to note, the, the actual information is also in your packet on the... 50th page. <laughs> you Thanks, Sarah. Okay. So then I think we can now move on from this agenda item from the uh, Welcome Center agenda item here and then to program reports. Jessica, we can come back to approving minutes and suspend. Well, I guess, do we want to suspend the rules and then approve the minutes and then come back to where we are? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'll move approval of the minutes. All right. 
I do I have a second? I second. All right, I have a second. Do we, uh, Jessica, do we want to take roll? Ooh, yes, please. Uh, Derek Ohanian, Vice Chair. Aye. Great. Uh, Cherie Lackey. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Amanda Ngola. Aye. Thank you. Kathy Hayes. Aye. Great. And Council Member Reed. Aye. Perfect. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Jessica, do you want to take on uh, 2022 program reports? Sure. Um, not to be nit nitpicky, but do we need a motion to suspend the rules? Council Member Reed, do you want me to do a roll call vote for that? Suspend the rules uh, for to meet virtual for what? To virtual, yeah, for virtual. Yeah, I thought we did that together with the uh, minutes. Oh no, we, we we don't. Yeah. yeah, we don't need to to do that. Uh, That's great. Yeah. Okay. Formality. Okay. So, yep. Uh, agencies did submit. Uh, this is their um, second report, actually, for the uh, 2020 funding year. So members will remember that we um, sort of our our 21 year was truncated uh, because decisions our, our timeline got pushed back. Um, so agencies received 21 funds pretty late in the year, um, and then the committee voted to um, provide level funding for agencies into 2022 so that they conti could continue their good work. And what you will find at the very end of your packet uh, is a summary of each agency's outcome. So we've got our case management agencies and our safety net agencies. For our case management agencies, um, staff tried to make the reporting very unified so members can see how many new Evanston participants enrolled in 2022, and then the total Evanston participants served, um, the number of contacts and service plans created, um, the number of referrals made, um, and then information about outcomes, including our most uh, challenge or the agency's most refer challenging referrals. Um, for safety net services, the format is pretty similar. We looked at the number of new Evanston residents, those agencies were able to enroll in services, and then the total Evanston population served. Um, the types of services, whether that was reported in hours of service or type of service. Um, and then who received deeper services, either within the agency, um, our number of external referrals and um, external referral partners. So if, for example, someone was receiving food, but they needed housing, where, where were they sent in the community? Um, and then the number of participants who exited services. So with that, um, I'm, I'm happy to field any questions if anyone has any about how the agencies are chugging along. Which by the way, I have to say, they're doing tremendous, tremendous work in what, what is still just incredibly stressful stressful times. Um, many of them have reported they're still struggling with staffing loss. They're still, uh, some of them are still struggling to hire staff and keep positions. Um, we've seen COVID spikes and, and um, that, that has also, as I'm sure everybody understands, proved really challenging to agencies. But, I, you know, the numbers speak for themselves. There's still clearly a need for the services that they're providing in our community. Any committee members have any questions for Jessica on that update? Okay, all right, thank you, Jessica. Um, I think the next item then is your staff report. Um, yep, so I do have a staff report. Uh, we mm -hmm. were able to launch the application for the child care premium pay, pay program. Um, the child care providers have until um, close to the end of the month to complete the application. Um, our close date is August 23rd. Um, it was originally the 19th and, and then staff heard some feedback from the providers. So 
uh, we agreed to extend the date. Um, we've been working with providers to um, help them meet the requirement of documenting family income for participants served and finding um, alternate ways to record staff attainments. Um, staff was under the impression that um, the majority of child care all child care providers were in the Illinois Gateway program and that um, those providers were logging their um, attainments in Illinois Gateway. I, we've since learned that that is not the case. Um, so, so we've come up with another way for agencies to report that information. Um, and we hope to compile our results and, and have that information for the committee at the next meeting. Um, I, I will say a source of pride for me is that um, we've, we've heard from a number of home care providers. So I'm very happy that our home care providers, uh, that, that we've been able to connect with them um, and, and get, get, them, get them on board with this program. Um, that being said, you know, we do look forward to hearing the, the, the results from, from the larger the center-based providers as well. So I'm, I'd be happy to answer any questions about that application process, how that's going. That's really great here, Jessica. Yeah, what is, so the results themselves, how, or the application itself, like what are the, are the questions being directed to the agencies? Are they being directed to the, like the childcare providers? How does that work? Sure, so, so the application is for childcare providers, whether they're home-based or center-based providers. We ask that either the business owner or the executive director um, complete the survey on behalf of all, all staff. Um, mm -hmm. The agency captures information for full-time and part-time staff. Um, originally, full-time staff was anyone working at least 35 hours a week, and, and part-time was anyone working um, 15 hours a week. Uh, we did hear that, um, that, that our part-time definition left some people out. So we tweaked the application um, to include a spot for agencies to also report staff who, who might work less than 15 hours a week. So uh, that's great. And we think with this information, we can present sort of a tiered model um, for the committee's review based on number of staff, whether it's part-time, the staff are part-time, full-time, you know, rough, roughly the number of hours worked, and then the populations that they serve. Um, so as, as a refresher, um, there was discussion at our last meeting about uh, providers who serve, whether it was 51% or more, um, low moderate income households. And so that has been highlighted as a, um, something that we're gonna take into consideration. Um, and then there was discussion about providers who maybe served 30% or more, um, or those providers who, who maybe did not have that information for the households that they served, or who served households who really didn't fall into that low moderate income category. So we don't have those results yet, we're, we're waiting to see, um, but that's again where I, where I hope to be able to bring back good information to the committee so that um, we do have that established budget of 500,000 uh, in ARPA funds. That is what went to human services and ultimately city council for approval. So committee members may remember we did receive council approval for that $500,000 as budget for this program. And so now uh, hopefully in September, we'll have more information to see how the committee would like to parcel out that that amount of money, that award. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I'll definitely be looking forward to, to reviewing those. Do any other committee members have questions for Jessica regarding the staff report? Great. Thank okay, you. great. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, we can then move on to our second and final public comment portion of the night. Are there any the attendees, community members who would like to make a public comment, please raise your hand so Jessica can promote you to the panel. Okay, looks like there's nobody else then. Well then with that said, I believe the last item on our agenda is adjournment. So thank you for everybody for joining as well as the representatives for Family Focus for their presentation on their proposal. And we'll yes. see you all.
Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just saying thank you. Uh, if I can chair, if I can raise one thing, yeah, uh, please. I, I do want to uh, ask the committee uh, thoughts on maybe trying out uh, on. Uh, at our next meeting and on maybe a trial basis, moving the committee meeting up one hour to six o'clock for a start time. Uh, if, if there's no objection, uh, you know, we can maybe look into that and schedule from six to seven as opposed to seven to eight. Does anybody, um, is, is everybody on the call aligned with that? From the committee, Jessica, Sarah? Yes, yeah, Sarah, go ahead. I just wanted to um, make the point. I don't think we know for sure if we're going to be allowed to be virtual in September. I, I believe the virtual um, meeting allowance runs out on the 20th of August. I think we will watch for that because I think that's an important factor <laughs> mm -hmm. for people. Um, yep. So we will just make sure that whatever the committee chooses will let you know when we hear any you know status of that so that it can inform the decisions and we can make that decision via email right sarah i think so to. i think that what we could do is is but if the committee would like to say hey we um we would like to move to six o'clock pending you know um being able to be virtual or if that doesn't isn't a factor that's fine too it's just something i wanted to bring up because um, if we do have to go in person, it could be a little more challenging for people depending on their schedules. That's what I was trying to just get to. That's a great point. And if I could just say, um, so I check uh, Illinois.gov uh, to, to see if that proclamation was renewed. Uh, and, and I usually don't get, get that information until the very end of the month. Um, so committee members, you might be receiving a, a <laughs> an email from me um, very close to the end of the month. September is a little bit challenging because uh, the first, I think, falls on a Friday. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm quickly pulling up my calendar. Oh, no, the Thursday. first is on a Thursday. It's a Thursday, yeah. So, so our meeting is really that first full week of September. So Depending on when the governor lets us know, I will I will do my best to let everybody know as soon as possible. So, I... yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, why don't we, uh, Councilman Reed, if it's okay, why don't we move forward to the assumption that if it's still virtual, six p.m. Yeah, yeah, sounds yeah. doable. And we'll play it by ear not, otherwise. Yep. Yep. Exactly. All right, and Derek. Are you? I'm sorry. I'm. This is an offline. Are you related to Tanya? Ohanian? Tanya? No, no, no. No, okay, I think okay. I, I, no, no. <laughs> no problem. Okay, no problem. Yeah, yeah. All right. Kathy, I think you I had your hand you. raised. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean oh, to... that was yeah. that was my that was my suggestion is that um we, that we would have to or plus there's some members that aren't here. So do we have to poll this um to see or can't and was the option of hybrid ever put into place? And my last thing is we'll just wait to hear from you <laughs> on what we can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We do, yeah, that's right. yeah. have, we do not have the capacity to do hybrid on, on a committee meeting um, because we don't have the, um, the technology. technology to be able to do that. In the, okay. I knew that was coming. I <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw it out there, but I figured that was the case. I will do my best to send out a quorum check on the 31st or the 1st, depending on when uh, we get that proclamation. And I should be able to let people know then whether it's an in-person meeting that would start at seven or a virtual meeting that could start at six. I think we might know sooner than the end of the month, because if it burns, if it ends on the 20th, usually <laughs> they renew the day before or the day of. <laughs> so um. we might know, know even sooner. <laughs> but well, it's not but, a week posted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but perhaps it would be good if we um, send out an email to the all committee members saying our intention is to move the, so it, gives um, members who are not here 
a heads up and, heads and up, I think yeah. that would be useful because it, it can yep. help everybody. <laughs> Organize okay. their day. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for entertaining that question, uh, Chair and, and members of the committee. And thank staff. Thank you, Council Thank you. All righty. Well, then I think if there's no other comments or questions, we can adjourn for the evening. I hope everyone has a great rest of your week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Have a good, good night. night. Good night. Bye.